So uh, I just want to begin this uh, exciting afternoon session by introducing Professor Meir Shachar uh, from Tel Aviv University who's here with us and he's going to be the chair of this whole uh, afternoon uh, panel. Dr. Professor Shachar is uh, an expert on China and uh, is working in the past few years more specifically on the movement of uh, cultural ideas and cultural paradigms from the Indian subcontinent to China. So is a particularly suitable chair for this uh, session. Thank you, Mayor, for being here. Thank you, Egal, and, and thank you for this wonderful conference that you arranged for all of us. Really, thank you. And we are going to have an exciting session this afternoon in which we go beyond the Indian subcontinent to explore the impact of Sanskrit poetics in general and Dandin's mirror in particular on Central Asia, Tibet, Mongolia, China, and Japan. And we go in this order, first Tibet, then further north, Mongolia, and then east China, and further east to Japan. And our first two speakers are two renowned Tibetologists, uh, Janet Gyatsu from Harvard University, and Pema Boom, who is director of the Latse Library, and they will speak. And here, I'm already fading in my role of, the of, uh, of chair. Actually, we, we change the title slightly. We change the title. So, the title. so the title is Beyond the Despairing, the Kavya Darsha, the Dalai Lama, and Mr. Smarty Better. So. Thank you very much. I just want to say that um, this paper is really a joint project between Pema Boom and myself. Uh, we, we work together very closely. Uh, it w mostly the examples and the material were provided by Pema. Uh, I, I put the words together, but it's really written by the two of us, and it's a product of our conversation. And so we had the thought to, we're actually going to read it, we're going to go sort of go back and forth re reading it by paragraph by paragraph. Uh, however, uh, just now Pema told me that when he was just reading through his parts, he found that only his parts, which is about half the paper, took 40 minutes. So if we find that it's going too long, I may, I'm maybe better at talking really fast in English. And so I may jump in and finish the paper because we want to try to finish. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> maybe you need some more patience for <laughs> my reading. My reading is so slow and uh, sometimes not so clear, probably. <coughs> OK, I'll try my best. Never had I experience and the real realization of the likes of the Marpa and the Mila didn't reach the level of the uh, <coughs> mastery of Xiong and the Pan. Stuck with the wealth or power on the peak of the uh, mountain, the useless life of a man comes to an end. With these words, the fifth Dalai Lama of Tibet Ngoan Lo Song Gyatso, his dates are 1617 to 1682, in his lengthy commentary on Dundon's Kavya Darsha, illustrates an example of dismissal through remorse, an Anushaya Akshepa. Now, Akshepa is a literary device whereby, as Bronner puts it, the poet deploys the aesthetics of saying no, which is actually quite appropriate that I'm citing you, uh, to try to disallow something. <laughs> And the type of dismissal through remorse appears to be a move to disallow a sense of satisfaction. So as Dundon put his own example of this figure. I earned no money, gained no knowledge, did nothing for my soul. I lived a long life, but wasted it all. That's Bronner's translation. Dundon presents the verse as an old man's lament about the failure of his life. It represents what such a person might say. <coughs> but in the hands of the Dalai Lama, the verse marked by the figure of Anusha Akshepa, while in some ways closely parallel to the original example, highlights the ingredients of the author in the figure. Here the fact that the verse is uttered by someone else, namely the man on top of the mountain, brings out a comparison with the author the Dalai Lama himself, who is pointedly not on top of a mountain, but is usefully spending his life in the Potala Palace as king of Tibet, certainly possessing wealth and power, and most of all, possessing learning, by which he is referring specifically here to learning in Kavya theory on a, part, on, on, on a par with that of Shong and Pang, 
the Tibetan translator of the Kavya Darsha and the work's first Tibetan commentator. In fact, the verses simultaneously addressed to the man on the mountain and uttered by him, by virtue of the Dalai Lama's transformation of the figure into a kind of ironic and spiteful ventriloquy. The Dalai Lama is suggesting that the man on the mountain ought to utter this verse while the Dalai Lama himself is enjoying a moment of gleeful schadenfreude. We, we have no question the Dalai Lama is addressing the Kagyu masters, uh, his nemesis, both politically in Tibetan history, but also as competitors for the claim of master of the art of Kavya. Perhaps we should call the figure of Akshepa here inhibition rather than dismissal. The Dalai Lama is using it to decommission his opponents by making them feel bad about themselves. And indeed, surely sometimes meditators on top of mountains must wonder if they made the career, right career choice after all. Dantin's Berlin uh, Kabir Dasha stands in tradition of Sanskrit poetic theory with a highly sophisticated uh, appreciation of uh, manifold power of language, particularly self consciously deployed poetic language, to communicate with uh, one's fellow human beings on many registers. For Tibetans who had already received so much of value from Indian civilization, primarily in the realm of uh, the Buddhism religion, the discovery uh, of Alankar Shastra, Alankar Shastra and uh, particularly the uh, Kabir Dasha was an absolute uh, <coughs> epiphany. It quickly became a massive symbol to Tibetans of how sophisticated uh, literature can be and how sorely lacking in uh, sophistication was Tibetan language, which indeed had remained oral up the 7th century. When Tibetan invented a system of writing as a part of an effort effort to translate Buddhist text into their language, it was only in uh, the 13th century. That's the great Tibetan scholar Satya Panchita, 1182-1251, presented the reach of the Kabyadasha to Tibetan uh, <coughs> intellectual for the first time. Quickly thereafter, Kabyadasha was translated into Tibetan by Shonten Doji Jamsen, the translator mentioned in the Dalai Lama's verse. In about uh, 1270, the first Tibetan commentary on Kabyadasha was uh, composed by Panglo Zawa Lodi Temba, uh, 1276 uh, to 1342, it's the beginning of the 14th century. It continued to be subject to a uh, subject of a large number of other Tibetan commentaries thereafter. In fact, new ones are still being written in our day. The Kabidasha is still studied uh, assiduously by students in Tibetan high school in China <coughs> today. Uh, this started in uh, this movement started in the 80s, after the end of the Cultural Revolution, uh, then the, uh, included the high first, like me, probably first generation studied the uh, Kabidasha in school, that's in college, then later included the curriculum, the high school, now is keep going. <coughs> This, this paper is about the uh, role of the Kabyadasha in Tibetan capital of Lhasa during the 17th century. It is about how the tools of Kabyadasha served Tibetan to communicate linguistically in a way that could accommodate the <coughs> uh, intricacies. intricacies and uh, over-determination of social negotiation. This was especially useful in <coughs> fraught and the delicate realm politics. 
both in terms of power over the land and in terms of the cultural politics uh, of uh, uh, prestige and uh, <coughs> cosmopolitan uh, province. Our examples will, uh, will be the writing on Kabiyadasha by the great fifth Dalai Lama, Lozang Jiangsu, himself the major force behind cultural climate in 17th century uh, capital, who in 1642 uh, created the Garden Portal, the United Tibetan State, which remained in power until the 14th Dalai Lama was forced to flee Tibet in uh, <coughs> 1959. In tandem with the Dalai Lama's commentary, we will also examine writings on Kabiyadasha by a bookkeeper Mipungela Namjil, 1618-1685, a close contemporary of uh, the fifth Dalai Lama and uh, apparently an active member of the court. Despite his affiliation with uh, the Gaju school, and uh, thereby uh, tendentious. tendentious relationship with the Dalai Lama was well as with the Dalai Lama famous regent, <laughs> Sanji Jamso. Like the Dalai Lama himself, Bekeba, yeah. his name means smart gay of Tibet, <laughs> in bracket, <laughs> was a leading intellectual of the time. We also know of his uh, fine writing on medicine, uh, medi medicine now, history and uh, theory. <laughs> and by the way, I just will add that uh, Pema just told me that he's one of three of the finest writers of messenger poetry in Tibetan history. Could you read? Yeah. I think you should read the next paragraph, okay. and, and then maybe I might read the rest, uh, much okay. as we like. <laughs> okay. you, you could read maybe the poem, poems and I'll read the rest, o only because we need to move faster. Okay. So, I'm sorry. As in the example uh, already examined, Dalai Lama directed a number of uh, beaten barbs of the graduate school in his commentary to uh, Kabidasha. The Dalai Lama commentary also incorporated another genre of Tibetan writing about the Kabidasha namely his exercise book, or page. Uh, a special genre, special genre wherein students of the Kabiyadasha compose their own poems to illustrate each of the figures described in Kabiyadasha. Usually a commentary and uh, an exercise book are published separately. But in the Dalai Lama's case, he mixed uh, them together, commenting on the root text and uh, then provi providing an uh, explanatory uh, poem of his own composition. It is not exactly clear why the uh, fifth Dalai Lama was so aggressive and often quite rude towards his uh, venerable this venerable lineage of uh, Marba and Milareba in Tibet, but it is almost certainly because of uh, the war that his uh, supporters fought with uh, the sports of the Gajipa school during process of the consolidating power in central Tibet, period to uh, 1642. And I'll just say that when we first started working on this, Pema was really highlighting the fact of how rude can be the fifth Dalai Lama. Okay, th while this is not made explicit either, it's commonly thought that Puk had his own commentary to the Kavya Darsha, uh, as well as his exercise book, served as a response to the Dalai Lama's barbs and was an effort to defend his Kagyu masters from the Dalai Lama's insufferable remarks. However, he himself owns up to this only elliptically. For example, a brief statement at the start of his Kavya Darsha only says, I'm not going to comment on this text in crooked ways, and I'm not going to contaminate my refutations with muddy water. My work is to straighten out issues in Dundon's exposition without confusion. 
Uh, now, at, at least the readers of the statement, according to Pema Bum, are convinced that uh, smart Tibetan is contrasting the good work that he himself will do in his commentary with the irrelevant machinations and diatribes that muddy the one by the Dalai Lama. But let us not fail to note, finally, uh, by the way, that the fact that nothing needs be to be said entirely explicitly, even about one's own intentions in writing a commentary, is one of the great virtues that Kavya Darsha teaches. By deploying the literary devices uh, uh, the, the, of, of, of the Kavya Darsha, uh, both the Dalai Lama and especially Pukheba, and remember, Dalai Lama is king of Tibet, Pukheba could voice otherwise dangerous sentiments without getting nailed for so doing. What this paper will be showing in part is that in Tibet, not only did the Kavya Darsha introduce much to students about the art of literary composition and literary analysis, uh, it could also be a tool that allowed people to say things without having said them, but then again to have said them, and perhaps even more powerfully than if they just said it straight, like you're no good or you're an idiot. Somehow using innuendo and double meanings and irony is even more effective in making one, someone feel bad about themselves in, in contrast to the great me. <laughs> so we only have time for a few choice examples, uh, but what we see in each of them will serve to show how central the study of Kavya Darsha's poetic theory was to Tibetan culture, or dare we say civilization, especially in the, in, in the capital in this important century, 17th century. Um, let's turn first perhaps to the biggest issue of all in the reception of Kavya Darsha in Tibet, an issue which is perhaps especially shared by its reception also in Sri Lanka, as we heard uh, yesterday. And it has to do with the inter in intersection or not between Buddhism, which is indeed the most cultural, uh, most important cultural force in Tibetan history, and Kavya. Now, the field of Tibetan studies is only recently looking at the so-called secular literature of Tibet. A classic category for classifying such writing is the old Buddhist rubric of the Vidyasthanas, often translated as secular sciences. The main list include, of five includes medicine, linguistics, arts and crafts, and logic, but there's other lists that add kavya, dramaturgy, astrology, and so on. All of these fields had great import in Tibetan centers of learning, but their place in a specifically Buddhist curriculum, uh, that is, in monastic institutions, was in dispute. And the two vid vidyasthanas with perhaps the highest controversiality and also the greatest impact on Tibetan culture, more generally, were medicine and poetics. Um, I recently wrote a book about medicine, which was a very vital field of learning, but was subject to doubt since its main system of knowledge could only very tentatively be attributed to the Buddha. Uh, and also because it directly contradicted central uh, elements of t uh, Buddhist tantric anatomy and physiology. Poetics were a problem for a different reason, not because of issues of textual authority, but rather because its subject was strongly associated with erotic love and other sensual pleasures and anathema to Buddhist monasticism. In fact, it appears that while most um, of the, not all, but most of the major commentaries to the Kavya Darsha were indeed prominent Buddhist monks, the study of Kavya Darsha took place in special seminars outside the monastic curriculum and outside the main institution of the learning. One sign of this tension may again be found in the, Kavya, in the Dalai Lama's Kavya Darsha commentary. Um, uh, this time, um, an example of Prag Abhava Hetu. The figure illustrates a particular kind of causation wherein it is an absence of something that, that serves as a cause. Dundon illustrates it like this. Okay. No real education, no heed to the ways, and the lack of self-control means uh, shows the way to disaster. So that's Dundon. Mm -hmm. And um, the Kavya Darsha, uh, uh, the Dalai Lama's verse reads as follows. Uh, didn't see it in the row of a uh, Mahamudra meditator. Didn't uh, uh, nurture the biographies of of all the great uh, gurus. Didn't wrap his uh, this uh, <coughs> human life around the mere sophistry. Uh, sophistry. Thereby did uh, I achieve uh, and I achieve pound and no shown and the pounds level of mastery. Sorry, somehow the first line dropped off of that. First of all, we can know that in contrast to our first example illustrating Anusha Yakshepa, the Dalai Lama is using the figure of causation due to absence to talk about himself. 
And also in contrast to the failure of the Kugubas to do anything useful with their lives, here for the Dalai Lama, the failure to do a list of things is good. And finally, the Dalai Lama's use of the figure is quite different from Dundon's, whereas Dundon uses it to showcase the conventional wisdom that education, <coughs> wisdom, and discipline lead to good things, and their absence leads to disaster, figure of the non-existing cause in the past for the Dalai Lama serves to make a really a rather surprising claim. Um, so the, th the three principal activities that the Dalai Lama says he hasn't done, which are meditation, guru yoga, and uh, philosophical debate, that adds up to uh, what Tibetan Buddhism is all about. And he's saying that he, he, he didn't do it, and that's what allowed him to be a great master of kavya. This is pretty surprising for the Dalai Lama, who distanced themselves from Buddhist practice, and it's of course a bit of a hyperbole. The Dalai Lama did perform sadhanas and countless Buddhist rituals, and he also wrote biographies of the Lamas. But on the other hand, it is true, actually, that most of his writing is about history or governmental ordinances um, or kavya. And what's more, the third line is a real jab at Buddhist philosophical debate, which the Dalai Lama dubs sophistry, uh, which was the specialty of the Dalai Lama's own school of Buddhism. Most of all, the, the verse is a real sign of how poetics uh, was inching the Tibetan court and with it uh, Tibetan culture away from the so-called Buddhist <coughs> hegemony in Tibet. In this Kavya seemed to signify something more secular uh, than medicine for the Dalai Lama. In fact, the da Dalai Lama wanted to prove that medicine really was Buddhism, but for Kavya, he was willing to say it's not Buddhist at all. Uh, we see further evidence of this um, in uh, the Dalai Lama's um, comment on something about the very first work of the Kavya Darsha, where Dundon is beseeching the goddess Saraswati to remain for a long time in his mind. Uh, we were talking about that this morning a little bit, and um, just reproducing the verse from the Kavya Darsha. This is not a Bronner translation. I'm not sure where I got it. Uh, May the lovely lady swan, the all white, uh, the all white Sarasvati, who sports amidst the lotus mouth of Brahma, roam forever in delight in the lotus pool of my heart. So, in the course of this discussion, the Dalai Lama is criticizing the famous Tibetan historian Tsula Trengwa, another major Tibetan scholar. Um, and Tsula Trengwa, in his own commentary, said that some people have said that this first verse is talking about visualization of Saraswati, in which Dundon uh, was addressing Saraswati in front of him. He was visualizing her in front of him, and others have interpreted the verse to mean that Dundon is actually visualizing himself as Saraswati. So when Tsukla Trengwa says this, he's using technical tantric Buddhist terminology about the varying degrees of identification with a deity that a med meditator can achieve. But the Dalai Lama berates such views as big talk that even scholars have never heard of, and goes on to name a few other arcane practices that the Kagyupas do, such as identifying Vikalpa and Dharmakaya and stuff like that. That's the kind of stuff you Kagyupas are always talking about, the Dalai Lama says, Wow, applying tech technicalities from Buddhist Tantra, even the translators and Panditas have never heard of it. Applying though the Buddhist Tantra to Kavya Shastra, a Shastra which is common to Buddhists and non-Buddhists, that's really great, he says sarcastically. <laughs> and maybe you should make Arta Alamkara into Abhisheka, maybe you should make Shabda Alamkara into this uh, so-called permission ritual. Maybe you should make a prahelaka into the introduction to the mind transmission, the Dalai Lama goes on. Then you'll really have made the Mahamudra uh, teachings really beautiful. <laughs> Actually, what the Dalai Lama just suggested is rather interesting, uh, that the use of poetic figures could confer special religious il illumination on their readers, much like religious transmission rituals. But it's clear he's being very sarcastic. And most of all, the point he's objecting to is the mixing the na confusing of knowledge systems. It's precisely this realization and mentality we think that signals the relativization of Buddhism in, in, in Tibetan Lhasa culture in the 17th century. Kavya is not Buddhism, and Kavya is a good thing. These are the two messages we can take away from the foregoing. So the mixing of systems is also key to a major conceptual dispute regarding the very structure of the Kavya Darsham in which the Dalai Lama and Pukheba are engaged. Uh, this time it's clear that Pukheba is re replying directly to the Dalai Lama's view. Um, and I'm going to start summarizing a little bit because I'm afraid about time. Uh, 
the Dalai Lama mentions the fact that in the discussion in, in the Kavya Darsha on the first chapter, that there is um, where he makes the basic distinction, Dundon makes the basic distinction between the body of, of Kavya and the Alamkars. That's the two main categories. Um, uh, once again, he is, uh, he was um, criticizing others who tried to introduce new categories into that discussion and he just dismisses them out of hand. Um, as, you know, Dundon didn't say it, so why are you saying it? And, but then he proceeds to introduce his own uh, new category, which he attributes to a, his predecessor in Tibetan history, that you really need to add a third category to body and ornament, and that is life force, or sok, probably best translated as um, jiva. Um, it's not clear exactly the translation of this word in Sanskrit, so just as one would decorate a person's beautiful life, enforced, in life force endowed body with ornaments, in the same way these alamkaras decorate a verse and the, the, um, the, or, the, or the prose or a mixture that constitutes the, the body of kavya that expresses the four kinds of fruits. And he, he says actually the notion of life force actually pervades all of kavya. Um, this is a major intervention, and he's actually attributed it to one um, medical um, commentator, uh, medical writer, very surprising that he has his own uh, commentary on the Kavya Darsha. Um, but we haven't been able to find that. But anyway, it's there. And, uh, but now for Pukheba's response. This is where Pukheba tries to nail the Dalai Lama. Um, so Pukheba actually cites Zorgawa's statement. He says, by using the metaphors of a person's li a body, life force, and ornaments, it's what makes possible these, the four fruits of kavya, the, the um, uh, moksha, dharma, uh, artha, and kama. Um, and if you don't have this category of life force, you're not ever going to understand how kavya works. Um, so it's a kind of interesting idea, but Pekeba is very distressed with it. He goes on to remark sarcastically, Zorgawa thinks he's found a good understanding that others have never noticed. Um, he says, uh, the Kavya Darsha itself says that body and ornaments, um, um, so, so Pekeba starts citing uh, all these Tibetan scholars who have said that actually there's just these two categories, body and ornament. Um, and these people, you know, the, all these very famous scholars have the flow of the Indian scholars' teachings, and they only give the two categories. But you, being overcome with the habit traces or the vasanas of medicine, have in mind the saying that if it lacks life force, who would take a man's corpse, however good? But, but Pukheba goes on, there can be ornaments on a chariot or a palace or a belt. We see many cases where ornament can beautify a substance that has no life force. Where is the necessity that this case of poetics is the same as the case of a person's body, life force, and ornaments? Even if kavya is like a human body, then if you definitely need the life force, why do you not also need the faculties, such as the eye fa faculty? The present case is not the same as the case of an ornament that will not beautify a naked body. We'll come back to that. How can you assume it is? If you think that the mention of a body indirectly must assume that there's a life force, why does not ornament also assume indirectly that there's also clothing? Because of your excessive attachment to your example, you have made dirty something was delivered clean. Uh, or is it that the uh, teacher Dundon was not skillful in his composition? Um, and so on. Uh, so he, again, he makes an important point about the danger of insisting that the implicit notion of life force in any talk of the body would best be made explicit. Um, and uh, we don't really know actually what uh, they had in mind about um, this notion of life force because we haven't been able to find the original text that talks about it. But we might mention uh, Gintan Trimple, and this was Pema's idea to try to explain it, who d is famous for having said that he could read the words, and he understood the poetic devices of English poetry, 
but he couldn't taste an English poem because he didn't know the way that people really talked in England. So we're just guessing, maybe the Tibetan category of life force in the context of Kavya refers to the emotive taste of a poem. Perhaps Perkeba and the other critics thought that um, um, this notion of vi vitality or soul was already implicit in Kavya Darsha and were really um, ex you know, worried about the proliferation of categories. Uh, and uh, some, th some kind of idea here, and I'm not sure um, where this is coming from, that he, he's also saying that once you um, add this one category, you're going to have to add others uh, using this example of that you, you can't decorate a naked body. So once you have a naked body, which I don't understand, but um, then, then that means you have to have clothing and so on and so forth. But maybe the most interesting point to draw your attention to here is the insistence on system, the fault of mixing systems. That Zorgawa, the guy who introduced this idea, because he works with human bodies, he got confused and he couldn't see Kavya as a system on its own uh, and, and was confusing them. And it's very important to uh, protect the boundaries of where poetry begins and ends. Uh, Okay, but in addition to these issues, um, there's also, a, I would say, a very big part of the electricity between Perkeba and the fifth Dalai Lama has, is less about these theoretical or substantive questions about Kavya and more about electricity, electrical flash, <coughs> pure rhetoric, poetry as an occasion to score, to score prestige, to advance a claim of mastery, and more convincingly than the others. Um, the, even the examples we've just looked at themselves seem to be primarily about who knows more about the authoritative system. Um, you know, how could you know more than Dundon? I know what Dundon knew, and so on. Um, so I'm just going to give you a couple examples and then we can discuss. We're actually doing okay. Um, All right, so let us give you a few examples where the Kavya Darsha was ingredient in the culture of prestige, such as the endeavor of writing a commentary or this uh, seemingly innocent uh, schoolboy's exercise book could become a medium for sly insults to one's nemesis and their teachings and lineage. So um, Perkeba does this just as much as the fifth Dalai Lama. So we're gonna turn to his exercise book to see his example of the figure of sama sokti, uh, or terseness in expression, whereby one can refer to something by talking about something else that has similar attributes. In this case, Pukheba is illustrating the subtype, which is bina a bina visheshana, uh, where attributes are only partly alike. So they're partially alike and partially not alike. So first of all, we have uh, Dundon's example of this again. This one? Mm -hmm. The swath of the bow, bow cigarette, bows, yeah. is not small. And there is a wealth of fruits and flowers. The shelter is good, and its uh, giver is strong. Thank, thank God I found this tree. That's mm. Brunner. Brunner's <coughs> translation. Um, so according to Brunner, I think it's Ratnashri who said that the, the bough and the wealth of fruits is applicable only to the tree, whereas the ability to give shelter and be strong is common to both a tree and a man. So here is Pekeba's example. Oh, and by the way, this is an illustration of the strange animal that he's going to invoke, which is partially lion and partially a Garuda. Um, who supposedly has eight feet, although this illustration only has four feet. Uh, included two wings. Oh yeah, two wings, six. yes. So, so, there's, so there's six feet uh. here, but not the eight. <coughs> so here's Pekeba's verse. Yeah. With the taut shape of an eight-footed uh, lion Garuda, he is for, forever posed haughtily in the monastery look at, looking super awesome. <laughs> he performs his duty, but he's actually inanimate. It's a child's mind 
who would find this wondrous. Again, nowhere does Plakeva admit, again, you see the similarities um, um, between this and the Dundon, but it's being twisted. Nowhere does Plakeva admit that he's talking about the Dalai Lama, but there can be no question that the powerful person he's mocking is the most powerful ruling, uh, the ruler of his era, and this is certainly how the verse is received. Uh, smart Tibetan mocks the Dalai Lama's power as mere posture like a statue or painting in a position that can be assumed but does not actually require animation or intelligence or creativity. It is as if one can be the Dalai Lama as a mere figurehead, a statue that does not need implied <coughs> talent of any kind. In other words, the Dalai Lama is brandishing his position. Um, but uh, that does not guarantee his true accomplishment as a scholar or sage. For smart Tibetan, only a child would be impressed with this. This is really a slam of the whole uh, re reincarnation phenomenon in Tibet. Uh, there's others in Tibet who have criticized this uh, uh, reincarnation for these very problems. But again, notice how uh, Pekeba, who is the exact contemporary of the fifth Dalai Lama in his court, you know, has to be very careful uh, by making such a claim about the Fifth Dalai Lama. Actually, th at one point in our uh, study of all these things, I asked Pema Bloom whether these verses were kind of a joke, whether they were fun. And Pema said no. He said, they're dead serious. <laughs> 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 <Jesus>. <laughs> okay, <laughs> OK, one more example. Um, uh, this one is an illustration of one of the subtypes of Lesha. Concealment, whereby one deploys, um, one deploys a different explanation for something than what is really true in order to confer either blame or praise. The particular subtype is the use of artifice of praise actually to deflate someone. So as Bronner puts it, it is a eulogy constructed in such a way that it ends up being nothing but criticism. So here's Dundon's example. This king? this king is the young and uh, upright, a friend, future husband, and uh, a hero, too. He cares even more about winning a war than about making love to his uh, woman. Okay, so as Dundon explains the verse, it, it allows a verse of seeming praise actually to work to dissuade a woman from considering the king as a potential husband since in fact she's most interested in his ability to make love. So it sounds like a praise, but it isn't. And we have a very similar example with um, the uh, Pukeba or Smart Tibetan's verse about, the, again, once again about the Dalai Lama. The gather of being, beings during the uh, fallen era is in the fall of bloom of youth. He has mastered all of the teachings on the uh, terminology of a convention and without attaching himself to any inner yoga at all, he has managed to hold the victorious one's teaching uh, by virtue of explanation, debate, and uh, conversation. Notice this one actually echoes the brag of the fifth Dalai Lama that we looked at earlier when he said he didn't do any meditation and he only masters the terminology of convention. By the way, I just want to point out of the many references that have come up already, I, I think Charlie was talking about this big debate between the mystical experience and con uh, uh, ultimate truth and relative truth. This is very much at the heart of this debate between Pope and the fifth Dalai Lama as well. But here, again, just very briefly, you can see how totally sarcastic he's he is and how clever the verse is. You know, it's praising him. You know, um, all, you know, what he studied is all these conventional terminologies, which we have deep as know are useless. And oh my god, he didn't ever, ever do inner yoga at all, and he's uh, managed to hold the victorious one teachings. Uh, can be terrific, but it's also like, you know, he didn't even, he never, um, you know, did any inner yoga, and he's, uh, he assumes that he can be the, the, you know, the holder of the victorious one teaching. This is outrageous. Okay, um, we are going to, um, 
just conclude now with just a couple of very brief comments. <coughs> um, okay, one thing that strikes us in the back and forth between Tibet's powerful leader and an intellectual in the court is how the very mechanism of learning facilitates, if not engenders, social interaction and the creation of values. This observation turns on how closely we have seen the Tibetan poetic examples follow the images originally offered by Dunden's verses to illustrate the same figures. Um, and we need to, we're very interested in this notion of the, um, sorry, this is my fault. <laughs> no, no, I don't. Okay. Yes. Uh, much we 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 find this whole practice of writing the exercise book extremely interesting. This page, um, but it seems so. At least we can say now it seems to be the case as the student of Kavya proceeds one by one through the Alamkaras. The examples given in the original text of Dundon uh, inspire a close approximation in the student's exercise book, although now intended to refer something in the fledgling poet's own uh, range of imagination or as relevant to his own life. So writing poems will inevitably reflect one's own experience, but they come up in the order of the poems provided in the Kavya Darsha. It produces a rather odd effect because it seems rather random, because the order in the Kavya Darsha is to illustrate these various principles of or ornamentation. Uh, but for the student writing, it's almost sort of like a Rorschach exercise of what does this inspire you to think about. But maybe it's the very randomness that frees the imagination. So while it's not the case that when smart Tibetan responds to the Dalai Lama that he's using the exact same alamkara. But, you know, lo and behold, as the exercise goes on, uh, here you find a mention of a king and all of a sudden says, okay, uh, Pekeba says to himself, okay, here's a good place to slam the Dal Dalai Lama. Remember kings? You know, that dumb king who never did any med meditation. Uh, so, um, but, uh, but this doesn't mean that uh, that makes the exercise trivial or merely idiosyncratic. Rather, the discipline of regularly writing examples of Alamkara in the Kavya Darsha provides an arena in which a variety of political, social, and religious concerns, as well as certainly autobiographical ones, come to be suggested and then formulated, expressed, eventually part of public discourse and memory. So just a uh, final paragraph. The mere number of Tibetan Kavya Darsha commentaries and exercise books in Tibet and the degree of precision with, with which the text was studied, memorized, and heeded shows what a significant force in the creation of culture that it was. Unlike in other cases in South Asia where the study of Kavya Darsha prompted detailed reflection on how the language group in question relates to things Sanskritic, <coughs> for Tibetan there was not really a question of relation to any Indic language at all. Rather, uh, Tibetans merely accepted the work as a foreign but brilliant treatise on poetics with valuable insights on writing and literary culture in general. They took it and they ran with it. And Tibetan writing has never been the same. In our first paper for the seminar, we, we talked about the resistance to Kavya Darsha in Tibetan history. Um, but the truth of the matter is that it always was a very complex combination, a veritable love-hate relationship with Kavya Darsha in Tibet. And we feel like we've just touched the tip of the iceberg, we think, with uh, the examples we offer today. So thank you for that. Uh, huh? Actually, that so works. It, that it one? just was, was off. Anyway, thank you for a wonderful talk. It's really astonishing to see how Dandin was important, not only in the cultural life of Tibet, but also in the social and political life, <laughs> discourse of the 17th century. So I'm sure there are many questions. I'd like to say something about the picture in front of me. Well, that because it's eight-footed, I think some of the, oh, because it's supposed to be eight-footed, it's not in the picture, but in the, in, the poet, in the poem it is, is that correct? So I think in some Indologists will recognize that as the Sharaba, which is always eight-footed, I think. But uh, in Tibetan context, it's one of the eight, er, sorry, six, the six gyan that go around a figure, the Buddha or whatever, and that's where you see it most often as a kind of a standing off to the side of the throne as the element of the, the, back, the backing of the, of the Buddha image. One of the six. And actually the Garuda is at the very top, which is a totally separate creature from the Sharaba.
in reality, so it doesn't look like this usually. But it does have eight feet, so I can't resist the idea that the eight feet are definitely directing your mind to the Sharba. Uh, includes actu actually the Guruda's two legs. But in some way, this artist didn't, uh, we don't see here. But in the explanation of this page, uh, mm -hmm. said this is uh, the creature. But that adds up to six. Yeah. And you need no, eight. That's, that's having eight because you count the wings as two oh. and then the feet of the root are okay. two and then the four feet. Okay. Yeah. Two. I've never heard of that, but it's probably true. <laughs> but it, the Sharaba is also a composite creature. Just what exactly the parts of it are is not so clear to me. One interesting thing I uh, just in the course of reading uh, Kam Kamdru, um, sorry, uh, Kamdru's commentary on Kavya Dasha that I noticed is uh, sort of like this uh, sectarian affiliation, right? Um, I one thing that one noticed is when Kamdru in Kamdru's commentary se seems that he uh, plays a uh, very high value on Pukeba's uh, poems, uh, both of them belonging to the to the Kagyu uh, tradition. And then when he talks about Dalai Lama, it's always some, some, somewhat mixed. I wouldn't say that all of the time he's uh, <coughs> criticizing him, but uh, there are numerous examples I won't refer to. But then uh, sometimes also it comes to my mind that there is uh, some forms of impartiality. That that's, a, that's an element in that as well. Uh, for instance, there are places where he would criticize uh, uh, but I, I think it perhaps uh, Kamdru represents this later generation uh, of scholars who have uh, more uh, uh, knowledge of, uh, of sans Sanskritic learning. A and then in, in the, the citation of, of poems, uh, sometimes he would, uh, you know, sometimes he would cite uh, the uh, eighth Gamapa uh, Ramjun Doje. So then here you can see, oh, okay, he's citing. Uh, a, a teacher who belongs to the same tradition, the Kagyu. But then he also cites from Tsongkhapa. So then uh, I thought that there's this mixture of things. So uh, just wondering uh, if Bema could uh, comment on, on that as well. So th 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 this religi uh, religious uh, sectarian affiliation, uh, the role of that in, in the practice of, of poetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, I'm not sure Dalai Lama criticized spe uh, specifically <coughs> Burkiba. Uh, Burkiba born after two years, Dalai Lama's birth. And Burkiba read his commentary after 30 years of Dalai Lama's commentary. That way, I think Dalai Lama is really little chance to criticize specifically Burkiba. But uh, he really, really, he's really rude to Kwaju uh, school in the commentary we read together, uh, many, many times. Many more. Uh, many more. It's pure rudeness. Uh -huh. didn't think that that was no, thing, but not only the vampires, include all films uh, masters, Kwajibas. <laughs> That's where I think, uh, uh, he when uh, Dalai Lama criticizes and the uh, uh, Bekiva is building up his anger, I think. Then later, after 30 years, then he wrote. But later, I think uh, Dalai Lama also changed. He well uses this kind of conventional uh, terminology stuff. Also, he changed his, his attitude to the poets from Kajiba, the Gamaba Chivarba, Michudorji. Who was exiled in uh, almost the whole life? The Karmapa was exiled by the fifth Dalai Lama. Fifth Dalai Lama. Yeah. He's ran away for a whole life. And he called himself, there's no one artist and poet like me in Tibet. And he called himself, he positioned like that. And then later, Dalai Lama's um, end of the life, he called, uh, come back to meet me. And he went to, Dalai Lama went to meet him and uh, brought him back. I think he 
the attitude towards two uh, poets and artists. Uh, he changed a lot later. I'm not sure, did I answer your question? Kind of when we in our conversation, he said to me that um, in the end, the Dalai Lama valued, it was more important for him to have a good poet in the court than to keep up this kind of sectarian dispute. Um, just on the body ornament soul issue, there's an exactly analogous, whether it's related historically, not exactly analogous development in the Indian tradition, and especially in Kashmir, this idea that you have to have a body and an ornament and a soul, and it's really the soul that gets ornamented, not the body. That's why we don't decorate dead bodies, and that's why Abhinava Gupta says an ornament on a, a shramana, I think is his word, is ridiculous, whereas on, so yeah, because of the transformation in the person's soul. I mean, what you say about this, uh, the medical commentator, it sounds as if he had read the, you know, the Dvaniya Loka or something. Well, that's a big question yeah. in Tibetan history. But we also saw something very similar in Anne's presentation in the Viracholia, even, at that point. It, it, there is this earlier idea, and you have this fivefold category much, much earlier, right? And it was body, rhythm, and... And, and breath or life force or something as the five categories of poetry. So it seems that there's this constant desire to inject this, this breath or life force. It also comes up in the Siyabas Lakra, if I'm not mistaken. Or wasn't there this something about the breath? Prana. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So where this Tibetan medical commentator is exactly getting it, that's a question. But it could also have just been, as yeah. he was excused, uh, uh, accused of, that he's looking at life. In fact, life is a huge issue for him, yeah. obviously, being a physician. Could the word potentially be Atma? Atma. I mean, no. It could, Why? It can't. Atma? Yeah. Could the, could the Actually, word okay, so there's a whole big deal on the word sok. It doesn't have a, a direct analog in Sanskrit. But it's sort of thought to be the older Tibetan word before Buddhism comes when they say there's no, and, and then you then get this new language of Atman. So why do you ask that well, question? Because it's Kavyanama is, is the thing that's at issue. In, in Abhinava? Yeah. That he's, he, 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 he calls it Atman. Yeah. I mean, is it the fact that, is it the, the Buddhist allergy to talking about Atman that could be at play here? That's a good point. Contagious? This is a very rich category, and I, exactly how it's functioning, I don't know. So, but I, I will look at the Abhinava for sure. Uh, thank you for this uh, very, very interesting and stimulating talk, uh, both of you. Uh, my, my first response is, why can't we get somebody like the fifth Dalai Lama to rule us? Uh, <laughs> My second response, <laughs> <laughs> believe me, uh, my second response is, is, is that it's just, it's a comment, that it's just amazing how the Kavya Darsha supplied not just imagery and not just vocabulary and not just final vocabulary, but kind of mo modes of, deep modes of thinking and expressing oneself in, in this court culture <laughs> it's it's it be be beyond the imagination of Dundin, I think. What 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 the, the if the impact on on thinking and on on, on speaking a culture cultural speech in Tibet. So that's a comment and, and, and there's a question about this verse, the Lesha verse. So you 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 you, s you kept saying that this is a way of saying without saying, but this being an example of of Ninda in disguise is so. So it's it is saying, <laughs> it is saying something about may, maybe it's not saying because it's not mentioning the direct object of the of the of the of the dig. But 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 there's no question that this is this is Ninda. So so it brings me back to your question, Janet, of how if 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 there is a possibility of also a light side to this very serious uh, debate. I mean, in this case, you really can read the line in two different ways. You know, he didn't practice inner yoga. Wow, he's amazing. Or he didn't practice inner yoga. Well, that's really amazing, but he still thinks he knows something. But it's, it's an example for 
or a device, a rhetorical device of condemning somebody. That's right, yeah. So the, so the context tells <coughs> you it has yeah. to be. But in this case, he does it so safely that it might not actually seem to be a, a condemnation. So I, 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 I think he's, he's hiding the fact that he's using Leisha because he's doing it in a, in a way that it could be read in the other way. Yeah, but his point is that when you put it in a book and you say this is Leisha, you're saying oh, okay. there's an implicit blame somebody in this verse. Yeah. Which is true for him as well, because right. it's in that same place. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yep. But is it, if it's a joke, I don't know. So Pamela, would you like to comment that other people also feel they're, they're kind of playing with each other? No, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's uh, as a Buddhist, Buddhi uh, Tibetan Buddhist, the Inner what? Inner what? Say? Which one? Uh, can I say in inner <laughs> uh, re realization? Can I say? Yeah. Inner. Yeah, meditation. Meditation. Inner meditation. That's um, one commonly understand most important to then to learn Kabidasha. That's common. As a religious person, especially for a Dalai Lama, he needs, uh, can I say, Kabidasha, because as a big lama, he need to write the lot of prayers. When lama dies, he need to write a prayer for incarnation come back. And somebody big lama, big uh, chief died, he need to write a prayer for we are born in some good place. He need that uh, as a tool. He need kabidasha. But without uh, religions, meditator, that's uh, all of them useless. He need the power inside. That's why without that you learn Kabidasha, that's useless. Yeah, that's uh, some kind of... Uh, serious, uh, serious criticism. Uh, yeah. This was really interesting. Um, and I just want to ask a question out of kind of uh, complete ignorance. Um, I, I, you mentioned in passing messenger poems. And I was, I was interested in the relationship between Sanskritic forms and something like working on the Kavya Darsha and composing something like a messenger poem, do they exist in the same sort of spaces where there's this uh, going back and forth between political themes and poetic themes? Uh, or what sort, what sort of spaces do, do Sanskritic poetic models operate in? Uh, are they similar? Yes. Um. <coughs> Just in general, when you're asking, in general, when are Sanskritic poetic devices used in Tibetan writing? <laughs> well, I, 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 I guess specifically messenger poem writing. Okay, well, maybe Pema can tell us something about messenger poem. Uh, who wrote it mm. and, and why and how did they use it? <coughs> mm, I have. Yeah. Uh, one is a Perkiba. The smart Tibetan guy. <laughs> he wrote one long uh, a title, Chenyi Ngamo Nansen, something like that. And uh, the person uh, to send, that's he imagined. There are no real person. And uh, the things uh, he express is a religion feeling how this samsara is meaningless, how, how much he feels lonely, meaningless, that kind of feeling. And uh, did I answer? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what you're asking. I mean, maybe I can just add, in addition to the, me so the messenger poem was written by two other people? Uh, another two people, one is um, much later, in 20th century. Uh, he's also big poets from Geluba uh, school. And uh, he wrote to his, uh, his lama, one of his students. He's a lama, but he's a student. Actually, really no, not far away, in Rekong, uh, where I come from. He's an upper Rekong, he's a student in lower Rekong. And uh, then he uh, actually not separate a long time, probably half a year. And uh, then he express how much he miss him. This teacher read to him, how much miss him. 
and the he wrote uh, from upper left corner to lower left corner looks like uh, he said a uh, hawk fly 18 years, <laughs> 18 months need to actually uh, this day is probably two hours <laughs> drive. <laughs> he made there's a river that river just uh, it's big but not uh, uh, there's no uh, <coughs> like a boat that, that such things. He made a really big river and in, there's many boats go around <laughs> and a lot of uh, uh, say, birds, different birds. Yeah, man is uh, something like that. Another uh, one is in 80s. That boat still alive. He, that time he was studying in Beijing and he's from Golo, uh, a nomadic area. He's a really good boat, still alive. He wrote uh, how much he miss uh, uh, his family members in Golo, in Tibet. Yeah, the, those three. But w one thing we might add is that often the the emotion directed at between lovers in Indian poetics is transformed into relationship between student and teacher. That's one of the major ways that this that Kavya poetry is used, as Pema just said to write praise poems to your teacher, which are super duper over the top, but using the, the technology of Kavya to do so. So, uh, and also in letter writing is another place. It's, it's also used, it's a sign of learning, it's a sign of being cultured. There's a, yeah, a lot to say on this. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. One of the things that I've been wondering about, frankly, through all the vernacular uh, local language sessions has been whether or not the Kavyadarsha stands alone as an iteration of Alankara Shastra, or whether it comes as part of a package, a broader theoretical package. And given the unique relationship of Tibetan to Sanskrit, I'm wondering what kind of evidence there is for a broader Alankara Shastra package a broader literary theoretical package that maybe, you know, I'm wondering does translating or interpreting the Kavya Darsha, is that kind of the flagship noting understanding of a broader, a broader capacity in Sanskrit literature and literary production? Otherwise, it's hard, you can't write a Sandesha Kavya just from reading. Um, I'll, uh, just from reading Dundon. So I'm wondering what kind of evidence is there, uh, Larry alluded to it and you didn't pick him up on it, um, what else is being translated, what comes along with Dundon that could also then yield productive Sandesha Kavya? Nothing theoretical that we know of, but before they translated Kavya Darsha, they translated all of the Buddhist scriptures and there are poetic works, Buddhist poetic works, Matricheta, Kshemendra, such things have been translated into Tibetan. There is a Tibetan translation of the Ramayana. So there's example of poetry and in Buddhist sutras galore. There's all kinds of Indian poetry, but uh, there's no other um, technical work that we know of. Um, Yes, yeah. So, so, there's, so, th so there's translation of actual examples of poetry, like you were talking about last night, the practice of it, but not... But no other Shastra. No other Shastra, I think, uh, that we know of. This is a big question. And, you know, in invoking Abhinava, this is a question, you know, why did the Tibetans not pay attention to Ab Abhinava? Because he's so close to their tantric sensibilities, you know, in a period where Tibetans were still crossing the Himalayas and bringing stuff in, but as far as we know, I, uh, you know, there's, there, was, there was no trans, even knowledge of him, really. So I'm, that's why I'm, I'm really not very sure. There are at least some manuscripts of Bama that are recovered in Tibet, I think. But there's in, the, in, the, in that there. Chinese, <laughs> the list of the stuff that's in Beijing, okay. there's at least one, I think, a couple manuscripts of Bama in Sanskrit, not translated. That, that came that from Tibet. And where Nyoli's manuscript came huh? from? Huh? Isn't that where Nyoli's manuscript of the Ramana came from? Didn't it come from? No, it's no. Well, one of the things we've talked about before is when the Kavya Darsha was translated, this Tibetan 
translator was sent to Nepal and he studied with several Indian teachers to do the translation. And so one of the hypotheses is he was in some kind of context where there was a lot of give and take and maybe he also knew about all kinds of other works as well. But, and, and he did, uh, the, the, the Tibetans were also, as we learned from Dra Dragomir's talk, the Tibetans were very familiar with Ratnashri, although they didn't actually translate it. So there's that. Last one. Last the last question. Yeah. So, it's, so question, a general remark and a question, but uh, so seeing all these translation of Dandin, I, I think of similar <coughs> phenomenon in Europe. One of the texts which has been most translated is the Ars Minor of Donatus. It's a text which starts with a. Uh, Partes orationis quod sunt, it's a question, and then the, the answer octo. And then uh, this, this text has been promoted by Charlemagne, Karl der Grosse, uh, from the Carolingian period. And in the Middle Ages, the expression donatus started to mean grammar. So you can have a dona français, which means a, a grammar for, for French. And, uh, and of course, when you translate so translating the Donatus amounted to writing a grammar of that language. Now, of course, there are specificities of languages. There are not always eight parts of speech, etc. So in, in the case of uh, the, the Dandin translation, uh, when you, you, you translate, uh, for instance, those gunas, which have a, a close relationship with the phonological inventory, what are the difficulties when you go uh, to Tibetan, for instance? Yeah, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. The Tibetan language was very much transformed. This was way before Dundon was introduced, but in the process of translating all the Sanskrit and Prakrit and Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit and so on, and Upper Brunsha stuff into Tibetan, the Tibetans devised you know, a system of the eight uh, cases, for example, to, that mapped onto Sanskrit ones. Uh, that also was discussed. That's another thing for us to study further. That was mentioned as a problem by Sakya Pandita, who's the first Tibetan guy who knew of the or talked about the the Kavya Darsha. As the the sounds of Tibetan are quite different, but when when they're translating or or they're giving examples of Shabda Alamkara, they use Tibetan kinds of examples which make sense in Tibetan, and we've we've seen this now in other cases as well. Dragen, huh? Yeah, Dragen, yeah. Yeah, uh, again, the first uh, such a pentata said not possible yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. uh? Yeah. Yondenchu. Uh huh. Yondenchu what? No, but they're talking about drug right? Uh huh. So the, the general issue. Uh, yeah, uh, you are right. There's a um, uh, Tibetan uh, traditional Tibetan poets. We divide two schools. When, like we mentioned here, Dalai Lama and uh, this book, he was uh, uh, there are uh, two in Nyangar uh, Melong, Kabidashi, two things. They were the Thoba and the Sharba. Galdia and Vai. Yeah. This uh, fifth Dalai Lama in the seventh, uh, there is a book he was, uh, we <coughs> considered uh, Sharba, really hard to understand. And uh, like Tsongkhaba and the Gontang, and uh, there's a group of poetry, poets called, uh, we think, is Toba. More like yeah. Fried Derby. Yeah. We have to stop. Yeah. Okay. So thank, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful debate. So we move further north to consider the impact of uh, Indian poetics and Dandin on Mongolia.
And our next speaker is Professor Vesna Wallace from the University of California, Santa Barbara.